Hey everyone, really quick announcement before we get to today's episode. We are finishing out the season and Revoice is just around the corner. And the co-hosts and I will be getting together there to record our season finale live. And if you are going to Revoice, we would love for you to join us. We are going to be doing it Thursday, October 7th at night after the grand opening session of Revoice. So if you are going and interested in joining us when we get together for our live season finale, find us after the main session on Thursday night. You can follow our Twitter and I'll be sharing some more details there as we get closer. We're going to have a lot of really great announcements, new updates. You are not going to want to miss it. So we hope to see you at Revoice. And with that, we will head into the episode. Welcome to the Life on Side B podcast. I am Sarah and I'm joined today with Shelby and Johanna Marie. I am so excited for this conversation. We're going to be talking about um, racial integration within Side B and like what it means to be included as black women. Um, I'm really excited for this episode. I hope that it comes from us as people of color to other people of color. I think we will be focusing a little bit more on the black experience because we're all black, but hopefully there's something to take away for everyone. Um, so how are y'all? How has your day been? What's been up? It's been pretty good. I had fun at work, looking at a bookstore, asking people what kind of books they want. Cute. We love. It was good. I went out for fancy coffee and went on a walk and enjoying the early fall weather. Fair. It, I moved more north recently and it's gotten cold all of a sudden and it's september and i'm just like not not there emotionally yet but <laughs> there it is <laughs> i yeah i'm still in tank top energy and that is not it's not the vibe where i am it's definitely fall very much fall yeah yeah, mm. <laughs> yeah i'm in florida and that is not the case we still have a full month maybe even a month and a half before fall really happens so I'm where you are, to. Sarah. I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we would start with a fun question. Um, and I have two. You can pick. You can answer both. Um, but it's what's your favorite comfort food? And then what or and or what album are you listening to right now? So my favorite comfort food. Hmm, it depends on the occasion, but vegan pizza is one of my go-tos for like a stressful day ending on a high note Mm -hmm. um and an album i've been listening to a lot i watched the new pink documentary that came out i think on amazon prime and so my love for pink was like re-energized from like Mm. middle school and so I've been listening <laughs> to all of her albums, her old stuff, Excellent. like early 2000 Pink, which has been a mood and great. So. Mm. I don't know. I'm, I haven't really listened to Pink in a while, but I did see the documentary, but I haven't watched it. Is the documentary just about her life? Is it about a tour? What are the vibes? It's about like a tour that she did in the UK or Europe, um, but it's about like her and her family and like being on tour as a family and like what's that like and like more of like her personality and stuff and I was quite obsessed with pink as a young child um so I very much enjoyed it (laughs) how fun I haven't watched it I'll have to 10 year old me really vibed to raise your glass by pink Mm -hmm. which is one of those things that you look Mm -hmm. back on and like Sarah what (laughs) (laughs) this is in no way reflecting your life or your experiences, and yet, here we are. <laughs> what about you, Johanna Marie? Comfort food or an album? Um, comfort food, probably oxtails or mm. chicken and dumplings. I made chicken and dumplings last week, and it turned out amazing. I meant to post, take a picture of the dumplings and post it, uh, but it didn't matter. I ate it, and then a friend came over, someone in our, like, bubble or whatever, and she came over and ate the rest of it, and it was, like, perfect. Mm. And I'm probably getting oxtails for lunch tomorrow because I've been craving it all week. Mm. Mm. 
though. Yeah, I'm, oh, I'm jealous. I'm settling into. I am food wise. I'm in fall. Everything mm. else wise, I'm not ready for it to happen. Yet. <laughs> but food wise, I'm like already like chili, oxtails, mm. chicken, and all the warm, fluffy, mm. carby, wonderful things. Mm-hmm. There. I feel like that tends to be my vibe the majority of the year. Um, as as fortunate as that is, <laughs> I don't think I think that's a blessing. Mm, yeah. Fair. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I told them I picked this question because I'm listening to Montero by Lil Nas X right now, and I expect it to like be okay with this album. But wow, it's incredible! There are a lot more songs that are in their feelings than I expected, and that's been a good energy. But also, like you can be in your feelings in some songs and then bop to the others, and it's just a good album. I'm a big fan of it. Ten out of ten would recommend. Yes. Um, comfort food is hard. I just love food. I really do. The making of it, the eating of it, all of the above. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is both of your first time on the podcast. Um, can you tell us, tell the listeners a little bit about yourself, where you're from, where's your sense of vocation, what are you passionate about? Just like the general basic introduction stuff. Shelby, go first. Okay, I'll go first. <laughs> so, um, I'm Shelby. Um, I use she, her pronouns. I... Um, live in Vermont and I have lived here for the last few years. Um, I work in local politics and like community organizing related to environmental issues. Um, and I would say I'm passionate about sports. I'm a huge sports lover. I'm mm. passionate about like building community, like throwing parties and having a good time. Um, And I'm passionate about coffee and good conversations. That's what I'll say. Love. Yeah. Yeah. I'm Johanna Marie. Um, Where do I live? I live in Florida. I've got to say, where do I live? (laughs) (laughs) Um, (laughs) I live in Florida, as I said earlier. Um, I, right now, I work in admin at a university, um, I have to work on the weekends at a bookstore, which I'm finding utterly delightful, um, so I am passionate about books and reading and history and poetry and art and all of those, like, fun, amazing things, and particularly, you know, how that is related to, um, my faith as a Christian, how it's related mm-hmm. to blackness, how it's related to queerness, like, I don't know, I just, like, mash it all together, and that's what I'm, like, passionate about, and also fashion, and fashion history, art history, yeah, I don't know, yeah, mash it all together, and see what comes out, I think that's what I'm passionate about. <laughs> awesome, how fun. How do both of you identify within the queer circles, and like what led you to being side B? What led you to using the language you use? Just a little bit more about that journey for some background. Um, how do I, uh, so this is Johanna Marie. How do I identify? I identify as bi um, and cis um, and black um, African American. Um, and what led to me like being side B? I mean, I grew up in church. I grew up in fairly conservative evangelical church so like the orthodox sexual ethic um, to me like that is where I was coming from when I started encountering like this conversation first with like other people um, and with like family members who are coming out and things like that Um, so for me it was more of a process of figuring out okay, I do believe the Bible, I, you know, I have my own relationship with the Lord, I do, which means I believe he exists, I believe in scripture, um, so kind of where do we go from here mm. um, was kind of the question, and I think for me, side B ended in the place where, the place with the most uh, authenticity as well as the most faithfulness Mm. to the scripture. And that's kind of what I was like, authenticity for queer people, 
care from for cis like from cis people and faithfulness for both to the scripture that and that's what i was looking for like how do we synthesize this and um i that side b is kind of where i found that like specifically like I kind of felt, found myself in that position without really meeting anyone or talking about it online. Oh, much. Wow. Pretty much everyone I followed online was affirming. Everyone who was also queer in my real life was affirming. Um, so I was like, I just can't go there, but side X is clearly messed up. Yet. Like, this is, it was in, like, the 2000s, so it was all kind of falling apart. Every year there would be someone who was leaving the, you know, X gay world or getting married or leaving their kids or whatever so it's like that's clearly not authentic and that's clearly not real and in you know and i'm also you know in college and in grad school and like that i think there's a lot that people who are thinking about this who aren't you know saved they're facing this authentically and are really investigating what this experience is and trying to pretend that that has no value also doesn't ring true um, mm. so the question is kind of where, what, what is the cross section of this where I understand that queer people have like things to offer, um, that doesn't throw out like us with the bathwater of orientation, <laughs> um, the baby with the bathwater, sorry, <laughs> mixing metaphors there, but like doesn't throw us out with that. Um, and I kind of land on, well, I'm bi, and I'm going to be faithful to God. I'm not trying to change my orientation. That doesn't seem to work. So here we are. And then I met a friend and talked about it. And they're like, oh, I'm in, like, campus ministry. Have you heard of West Hill? Um, and I was like, oh, okay. And so on and so forth, wash and waiting, spiritual friendship, the blog, and the book, and just <laughs> falling into that online world and actually meeting people. So, yeah. I would say for me, I identify as a lesbian. I am black. I'm cis. Um, yeah, that's how I identify. Um, for me, for side B, I grew up religious, like going to church and stuff. Um, but sexuality wasn't really something that was really talked about for me growing up. Um, mm. So... It was like mentioned on an off chance but never like explicitly um other than like kind of like some like purity culture or stuff but other than that there was like no conversation about sexuality um so yeah so i realized in college um that i wasn't straight i wasn't sure what that meant um so a lot of it was working through, um, I don't know, le lots of fear of hell and what that means. And like, can I just like choose not to, like, if I follow this path that obviously leads away from God. So I don't want to do that, but I can't seem to change my attractions. And like, I like all these people, like, what do I do with that? So I didn't really know how to integrate it all. Um, but I had like, my senior year of college, I had, like, a mystical slash experience where, like, I finally felt like God truly loved me as I was. So after mm. that, there was, like, a lot, a long time of, like, discovery of, like, reading theology and books, like, Washington and Waiting and things like that, of trying to, like, figure out how do I reconcile these two things, being open to the possibility of being affirming or not affirming. Um, so... That's kind of how I landed on side B. Yeah, thank you both for sharing. Yeah. I think it's cool that neither of you started out with the like intense theological, like, let me sit down and figure this out and read all of these books. But like Shelby, you're starting from this place of like deep love for God and Johanna Marie, you're talk starting from this like understanding that you already had of who God was and like what it meant to live authentically. And I think that's really cool. Can, How mm? uh, can I just say, like, I, I, um, like I literally couldn't even come out to myself until I had a similar experience, Shelby of like mm. actually like feeling like, like having this question of God, do you even like me as a person? 
Like, not even do you just love me, but do you enjoy who I am? Do you look at me and you're like, oh, Johanna Marie, or is it like, oh, another human? And once that was settled, which that's like months of like processing and whatever, then that's when he was like, let's talk about this. The thing that you're like in the corner of your eye, not really acknowledging. So I don't know. I think that's so cool that we both have that like, I don't know, just really a life affirming experience. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely had a coming out to God experience, which was weird because God knows everything, but also like having to say the words out loud was really big mm-hmm. for me um, and changed a lot of things. Could both of you talk a little bit about like your racial and ethnic identity? I think you both mentioned identifying as Black or African American, but how that shapes the way you see the world. That's a really big question. Um, and you could take that in whatever direction you want to. Well, I would say, like, being black in my race, like, shapes all parts of my experience. Like, it's, I can't really, like, separate it from any aspect of any of my experiences. Um, Yeah. Yeah, because some of my, even my, like, my earliest, like, memories is, like, feeling othered in school and, like, not mm-hmm. wanting to stand out but standing out like regardless of what I could do because I can never like blend in enough because I'm very much like I want to like be like everyone else around me and it was like impossible to do that because you obviously stand out so like some of my earliest memories are about being black and what that means and like as a small child so like I think like working through race and what that means working through like shame and what all that is like was very like foundational to like working out of my identity um and Mm. who I am um so yeah so I feel like it like it shapes all aspects and it's always in the back of my mind even sometimes in conversations that I'm in and situations I'm in especially living in a place right now that's not extremely diverse I'm aware of my race (laughs) a lot of the time Yeah. yeah 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 I definitely resonate with that um, Joanna Marie, do you have an answer to that? And I think it would be interesting to hear about how blackness has shaped your religious experience, particularly, um, after you answered Johanna Marie, if you have thoughts on the first question. Yeah, I mean, I agree with Shelby. Like, it's like, it's not anything that I can separate out. Um, to be honest, I see it as a part, even, of my sexuality. I think in, like in 2017, there was this article in like Afropunk titled um, My Gender is Black by mm. Kari Ziad. And I was like, oh, this is, yes. Like, it, and they were talking about gender and sexuality and kind of how, what blackness means. Um, I'm gonna get real academic, it's fine, whatever. So he's talking about how um, various like, literary theorists and philosophers particularly black ones have talked have talked about how gender and how being man or being woman how this idea has been constructed in since the 1700s since this acceptance of the idea of race to exclude black people such mm. that the mar the, you know the majority culture white culture always sees the way black people do gender as wrong, so men are hyper masculine, and what? And actually, what are they just see us as hyper masculine, and no matter where we are, and that is a weirdly dehumanizing like process, um, and it means that the ways we want to like naturally interact with each other um, are always seen as suspect, and then you add queerness on top of that, right? Yeah, um, and you add like being attracted to the same sex on top of that, or you add not like the gender you're being assigned, not being the gender you're, you're like pretty sure that's not my gender actually. <laughs> on top of that, like that, like I don't know, it it really it adds a layer of complexity that makes it hard to like separate. Um, a 
was talking to another side view friend, and I was like, so what do you call it when, like, I'm sure I'm a woman. So like I said, I'm cis. I was assigned female at birth, and I said, yep, that's me. But every time I go out in the world, um, it's questioned. Mm. You know, like, what do you call that? Like, yeah. I mean, it's because that's not what we would call a cis experience. And I think some lesbians and, um, you know, other women, loving women in literature have talked about being gender nonconforming and kind of what that means. But it's also interesting or weird or hard when it comes not even from the place of sexuality or gender, but from a place of race, because you're not doing it right. As a, mm. you know, dark-skinned black woman, as a fat black woman, as a whatever, or a black person of whatever, like, I don't know, there's just, like, other layer there, and it's hard, and it, I don't know when or how you can peel it apart, or what things it doesn't affect. And that's not all, also not to say that it's all, all been all, like, like, how does blackness affect you? Oh, man, everything's hard. No. Like, <laughs> I feel like church-wise, um, like, if we're talking about how race affects our spirituality and our faith, like, church-wise, I've pretty much always been in evangelical circles, which have been mostly white, except for when my dad uh, was pastoring a church that is, the denomination came out of Nigeria. So... Again, neither of these are majority African American spaces. But they're just two different spaces where culturally there's a lot of difference. Um, but my queer life, in person at least, has always been with my family and close friends, and it's always been full of black AFAB people um, who. So, who, you know, and all of whom are affirming. So there's like been this weird mm. dichotomy of like mostly white evangelical Christian world like online with people who are talking about that and committed to the same things I committed to but in you know in person you know almost everyone I know who is black and a woman who I'm pretty close with is not straight <laughs> so that's kind wow. of or and even like my academic life has been very black feminist black womanist centered so I don't know it's been like a weird like, how do you balance these things? I don't know. Yeah. Oh, you said so many good things. I really want to read that My Gender is Black article. I I think it's so just, like, academically interesting to think about the ways that we construct gender or gender nonconformance and the ways that, like, I think sometimes doing it from just a gender lens misses so many of the nuances of the ways that we are shaped by the world around us yeah wow um johanna marie not to put you on the spot but can you say a little bit more about how you've reconciled the two of like being in these beautiful black affirming spaces but then also being in these white evangelical spaces um i think that's kind of if we're talking about like where we are spiritually or academically or personally like, that's kind of where I, like, I'm, I, there was a, a time of denial <laughs> when we weren't talking about the fact that sometimes women are pretty, and also sometimes trans people who are not women are pretty, and everyone's, actually, it's everyone's pretty. <laughs> we aren't taught, you know, we had the time where we didn't talk about that. Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, okay, Jesus, this is a thing. How do I reconcile this? It's like, okay. My personal relationship with the Lord reconciled that, but then didn't have very much community. Then finding side B people are like, okay, there's community here, there's support here, and there's a way to imagine like what your life will look like mm. if you are not married and if you are committed to um, celibacy, or you know, if you are married and what that looks like as a Christian and not hiding that. So I think that's kind of the next stage for me is like figuring out, okay, what it like? How how do I blend these things? Because I I do think that there's a lot that Christians miss. I mean, you can see the evangelical kind of uproar about like critical race theory. Like, I'm like, oh dang, well y'all definitely can't handle 
any of the other things these black women have to say. Oof. Because <laughs> they just said let the thing that like ninety eight percent of black people agree with and it was a problem. So <laughs> we definitely can't talk about the parts where there are actual real differences and Hmm. Dis- disagreements that are valid like yes we can, we're coming from different places because we believe scripture to be real and relevant and ask the askings of our lives that i believe i should actually offer to god but that still doesn't mean that they haven't been thinking about something that we haven't been yeah. and that we shouldn't take that also to the cross and be like okay lord help me parse this out hmm. help me actually again face reality and hear what you have to say about it. Not pretend that doesn't exist. And then interpret the silence that you're hearing from God as something, you know, as something, as some mandate to everyone else. Because you haven't actually sat with him to pray about any of these things. Not you, people. <laughs> but yeah, that's, I feel like that's where I'm at. I'm just like, okay, Lord, I, as far as I can tell, these things are true. Um, you know, I mean, Alice Walker has a lot to say, you know, like if we're going to go old school, right? Like Audre Lorde has a lot to say. Um, and I, I think the thing I inherited from that tradition is not being afraid to talk very frankly about sexuality and sex and gender while still being fully submitted to Jesus and what to do about it. Mm. And the thing I think I want to shed most is this fear of being honest and the shame I feel like that comes from the evangelical world. I feel I admire the faithfulness. I that is who I see myself as a very devoted and faithful person who is who loves Jesus. Um, but I don't think Jesus is afraid of those things. I don't think Jesus is afraid of our orientation. I don't think he's afraid of our gender. I don't think he's afraid of where humanity actually is and where you think that and where we think that comes from. I don't think he's afraid to wrestle with those things. And I think that's what I would want to take that language that gives us the ability to actually wrestle, you know, to kind of be Jacob in the night and wrestle with God until he blesses us. Like, mm. yeah. Sorry, that was a lot. <laughs> oh, no, it was so good. I so appreciate so much that you shared. I, I would say for for me, I I grew up in like a relatively like small denomination, very separated from evangelicalism in a lot of ways. Um, that was like diverse, but definitely like predominantly white and like a white church, um, but diverse. Um, and I would say like a, most of my like black friends came from church, um, not from school, which was like an interesting dichotomy there um but also my grandmother is a pentecostal pastor and i used to spend summers with her so i also like grew up in like a very like holiness movement pentecostal environment for like months Mm -hmm. at a time but also this other like not black (laughs) environment too so i feel like i had both of those religious experiences growing up um And I would say, like, finding out more about, like, Side B online and things like that has been my entrance into evangelicalism. Like, I didn't know about, like, all of these different people that they all talk about. I didn't know all, like, lingo of, like, I just didn't grow up within it. So, like, it's been interesting, like, like, meeting Side B people online and things like that and, like, learning all of these things about evangelicalism and like white evangelicalism in particular that I did not grow up learning or knowing about. So that's been oh, that's an interesting fascinating. process for yeah. me. Yeah. Especially in the last few years, like it's just a, a very interesting time to be entering into learning all of that. Wow. Yeah. I think both of you have talked about this a little bit. But how would you say that you've seen Jesus engage the intersections of your ethnic or sexual or gender identities? I think Jesus has engaged it in the fact that, like, he understands. I think that a lot of my, like, experiences of race and sexuality and things like that has been ideas of exclusion and, like, people not understanding and, like, not fitting 100%. 
Um, mm-hmm. But realizing that, like, I fit with Jesus and Jesus gets it and, like, reading the Gospels mm-hmm. and, like, how he didn't fit in with his family, though he fit in with them more, but also, like, didn't fit in with, like, the writer society, like, the Roman Empire, like, didn't, like, fit in lots of different spaces. And that's kind mm-hmm. of how... I grew up feeling of like not 100% fitting in lots of different spaces um but I think also I learned a lot from Jesus of, like, the idea of like suffering and dignity of the idea of like choosing to suffer at certain times but also like realizing you have an, an innate dignity and value from God was really important mm. for me um and I've also just like gained a lot from the African-American religious experience and history I think like growing up going to my grandmother's church which has like a lot of issues but also I learned a lot about like the ways that like Jesus can relate to like society and like the ways that we can like how his commands reflect more than just like our spiritual lives but like our physical lives and like shape should shape community um so yeah so I, I think I've encountered a sense of belonging with Christ that I haven't mm. encountered a lot of different places. Jonathan sees me, but I was nodding the whole time. Shelby was talking mm-hmm. like, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, we should also talk more because I also, I grew up in a Pentecostal holiness church. Um, so, I don't know, there's a, not a lot of us, but we out here. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I I feel like it's almost hard to see because it's like the water I'm already in. Like, how is Jesus not? It would be more, it would say more to say, how is he not? But like, I think my language for all of this has always been very scriptural. Like, when I was a teenager who was super depressed and couldn't like process my feelings, I just read the psalms, prayed the psalms, I taped all the super depressings, I printed them out in like super gothic fonts and cut them out and taped them to my walls and people were like, <laughs> okay, and they were like, okay girl, what, what, what's going on? I'm like, I don't know, my bones are crushed beneath the weight of the arrow that is in my heart that the Lord is pressing on me, my tears are my bread, that's what's going on, like, that's relatable. <laughs> like <laughs> hardcore Christian goth kid, like just mm. read songs all day, or like renaming myself, like the names of um, Hosea's children. Um, if you've read Hosea, like the, basically Hosea has married this prostitute, and because the Lord tells him to, he's a prophet, and he's like, "Go do this," and he does. And then the woman has children, but she's a prostitute, so I mean, they're his because they're married, but he's kind of like are not my children and the Lord's actually like yes name them that first of all I don't know how these kids felt but I was definitely as a depressed teenager and the names are things like um, not loved not remembered forgotten not my people and I was like yes Abel Loaha forgotten I am not loved I'm like whatever obviously like I the link like for like the Lord gave me language for the pain I was feeling through his stories on a like a very personal you know dramatic teenage level wow. and it's like been that way the whole time like when he finally moved me beyond like chapter one of Hosea and I was like yeah I renamed them later <laughs> and I'm renaming you and drawing you in and you are now my people you are remembered you are loved and pitied and like I have mercy on you and like there's like the joyful psalms too there's you know whole chapters of them that like giving at like actually giving me that experience um and then like as i was like i don't know dealing with race stuff like like because growing up in an evangelical world like shows that you want to fit in um you know my parents are pretty conservative but i was and we were homeschooled, they're pretty conservative, so you're, I'm getting the full evangelical experience. My mom did, like, she hosted, she was a youth, so she was our associate pastor, and also led youth events, she was a true love weights coordinator, like, passion and purity, we're getting the whole evangelical fire hose in the, over in my family, <laughs> like, 
Um, but when I started realizing, I think what my parents were putting on me was like this devotion to truth. And I, the main thing was this doesn't align, this description of America and how it came to be does not align with the reality of race and race relations that I'm experiencing. And it doesn't align with the reality of the way most black people who are, even those who are Christians, talk about how they're experiencing it and was feeling this huge alienation. You know, then the Lord was like, the story of Rahab was like, just dear to, I don't know. So like, I feel like the whole time, the main, I would say the main thing Jesus has done is like, give me language that leads me back to him. That act, but that accurately reflects what is happening in my heart or what is happening with the people around me. Mm. Because I feel like what the what I was told to do was fake it till I make it, be joyful, be grateful, you know, sit down and shut up. And whether it's about race or about sexuality or about gender or all, any of that stuff, and that just wasn't the way the Lord dealt with me. He gave me pictures and through his word and but all of those pictures while accurately reflecting my heart and what i was feeling also accurately reflected where he would take me next out of my feelings because of the things he was doing um you know when i started you know leaving the conservative whatever and i was like i don't know lord and i was stuck in luke reading mary's you know um the magnificat and that was like, I was like, okay, okay, I'm with you, Jesus, I'm going, I'm just going to keep following you. It's, if I can find it here, if I can find this experience here in scripture, then I can go with, then I can go with this. Then the Lord can take me there and he will, he will find the safe ground. Um, so I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I, I just love how both of you talked about like this experience of like Shelby you talked about like finding your sense of belonging with God and like God giving you the words for your experience through Hannah Marie it's just so deeply personal and I think I don't know it's hard sometimes to find the words for your experiences I was reading for a class before this and just thinking reading Audrey Lord and just thinking about how grateful I am for people that like I feel so alienated sometimes in the world, especially when it comes to language and being able to find that language within academic work, but then also like you were saying within the Bible, like what a gift, what a gift. Um, so this is a little bit of a more academic shift in the question. Um, but I've heard a lot of people talk about the importance of separating the like frames that we use to talk about our race ethnicity and then the frames that we use to talk about our gender and sexuality. And I think even in this conversation, we've kind of blurred the two um, and talked about the ways that like one informs the other. Have you all, do you all find that separation important? Is it something that you've been able to do or do you find the two kind of co-constructing each other? I feel like the separation is important, but also they're intertwined at the same time. Like, mm. I think mostly because I think about the two in different ways. Um, I think, I think one of the main reasons is because like I've always known myself to be black, but I haven't always known myself to be queer. So that's like a different kind of thing. Like I can go into a yeah. space and people see me as black. They don't know necessarily that I'm queer unless I like ex like disclose it so there's like a disclosure mm -hmm. like having to like put yourself out there aspect that's different than race like like you're automatically race whenever you enter a space but you're not necessarily automatically mm -hmm. have all these other stereotypes put on you so it's like actively choosing of that in some senses <laughs> um yeah, which is yeah. different um but I would say that um they are intertwined in this fact that like I experience racism in queer spaces so like mm. it's so like I experience that everywhere um and I think like 
the experience of racism just feels different than the experience of like any sort of like homophobia or something like it just feels different I think because of the fact that like it's been with me longer but I also know how to deal with it better in a sense so it's like same mm. and different um yeah but yeah I I think um yeah, so they're definitely intertwined with to me, but also I can easily separate out the experiences, too. Um, but I think, yeah, that's what I'll say. <laughs> I lost my train of thought there. But. I mean, I think, so I've encountered this question mostly, I think, from people who are, like, Christians and committed to, like, um, racial reconciliation and racial justice but don't and feel like if they express that they, they also must then express an affirming theology of like same-sex sexual relationships in marriage because of the discrimination factors and things like that um and it's like well if you're against discrimination here why are you for discrimination there so on and so forth um and to me like I think there are ways that they are the same, like, i.e. the discrimination factor, <laughs> like, discriminating against people such that they cannot find places to work, find places to live, feed themselves, shelter themselves, so on and so forth. I don't really care which one of the, like, whether it's race, sexuality, disability, gender, you know, I, I think there's ways that oh, those are all the same and that people are owed, like, dignity. Mm-hmm. Uh, and... Um, as Christians who believe that every human is made in the image of God, more than anyone, we owe other humans dignity because we believe we're seeing the image of God in the world, um, even if it has fallen or changed by sin in some way. Um, I think they're different, and actually, that one of the ways that because I had a recent conversation about this, and I was like, well, first of all, the defini- like the things that make up the identity, the very definitions are different. Race is first, it's not like a universal human experience. It was created at a particular point in time. Hmm. Um, it's an idea that was created by certain people <laughs> um, and then disseminated and we've accepted that, and it and it's changed the world because when everyone agrees to think of things in a certain way, that changes the world, <laughs> like money. Or we agree, if we all agree the dollar is worth something, then suddenly it's worth something, and you can buy food with it, and you can do very real, tangible things with that idea. And race is very similar, but ethnicity is, is like a universal human experience. So there's already a difference even there. Whereas people form groups, they form culture, and that they pass down that culture usually to their biological children and often to people they adopt into that culture. Like, so that's universal. So race is different from ethnicity as an identity. And then how both of these things are different from sexuality is like there's not for both race and ethnicity there's a sense of history. Like you don't just mm. pop out into the world a black person you usually have to have black parents like that's i haven't met yet a black person who didn't have whether biologically usually almost always biologically i'm like i'm trying to i'm guarding my words because i'm like maybe this could happen no friend like that's how this happens two black people have a black baby that's what happens that's how that identity was that's the definition of it that's how it's formed Whereas anyone can be gay or bisexual or pansexual or trans, that, that's not dependent on your tendency, as we're discovering, might have something to do with your parents and their experiences and that kind of what happened in the womb or whatever, blah, blah, blah. I'm not the science person. Talk to other side view science people. But anyone can be that. That's not something that's dependent on anyone else's relation to the world. Anyone can experience same-sex attraction. Anyone can be assigned a gender and then be like, well, I don't think that's... There's something not right here. This doesn't fit. <laughs> um, 
Like, and we have record of that experience throughout the world in pretty much every culture. It's not so... The way those things work means necessarily there are going to be similarities and differences. Um, and I think as Christians, we tend to think that God has a purpose for sexuality and ethnicity and culture. And we tend to think the Bible has something to say about that. And one of those major differences is that, oh, the Lord, you know, if we're t you know taking like an eschatological view, every tribe and tongue and worships before the Lord, every nation brings something to the gift of God. And yet at the end, we are made like the angels who don't marry or are given marriage to anyone of any sex or gender. Mm. So there's differences in the identity itself. There's differences in how scripturally we see God, you know, redeem these things that have been in, in any aspect have been like changed from what he planned. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there, I think there's just differences in personal experience, difference in the very definitions of how these identities come to be, and difference in, like, the way we see scripture actually handle them. Um, yeah. And I think the way, the differences in the way we see scripture handle them have to do with the differences in the way they're experienced and formed and defined. Mm. Um, so, yeah. And I would also say, I think the differences and similarities, I think also has to do with culture in the sense mm -hmm. of like experiencing being a lesbian in a black space is different than in a white space. So like those things change too. So I think that's how they can intersect and like kind of ex like change them so like what it means to be gay and black is different than just like what it means to be gay um and i think also like the history of at least for like my family the history of like thinking like oh like queerness and lgbt things have to do with like whiteness like that's like a white thing like mm. that's like a middle class white person's dilemma like we don't deal with those things like either you've been like enmeshed in whiteness in some sense or you've been like recruited by someone or like <laughs> someone told me um Ooh. to like into this <laughs> into this like group like you don't just like naturally or are a part of it like you have been like co-opted or recruited in some sort of way um mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so i think also as a person who's like, experienced black spaces in black life i think that influences the way I think about my sexuality because of those my family background and culture yeah yeah absolutely I don't know I have such feelings about like that narrative like y'all say that but then it's like you erase from the to like really make that a thing you have to erase from the family tree all the aunts and uncles who just never got married or let's be honest, like our age, all the like great aunts and great uncles, particularly usually great uncles who passed away, you know, from AIDS, like, you know, something that like my dad you know, didn't tell me about till like probably five years, oh yeah, uncle so-and-so, he died in like 80 something, or it was probably from AIDS. I was like, oh, so, and he, like, we're in the South, okay? In these small segregated towns, there's, he was, there was no way he was co-opted by anyone. Like that's all you see with black people. And you're related to like fifty percent of them, <laughs> like in the fifties, sixties, seventies, in these like rural southern towns. Like you just, I don't know. It's one of the most. I feel like whenever I encounter that, it's one of the most tiring narratives because it's like I don't even know how to break down the obviousness of this falsity at this point. <laughs> yeah. Like y'all just keeping secrets. That's just what it is. You're keeping <laughs> secrets and then pretending like. The facade is reality. And I think... Like, I just got real black for a second. <laughs> oh, no, I appreciate it. <laughs> okay. Like, tell the I truth think... and shame the devil, okay? Mm -hmm. 
And I think it also just ignores the rich sexuality that we see in like African cultures way, way, way back when. And these beautiful ways of understanding like gender and sexuality and the ways that people related to each other. Um, I went to this panel called Is Queerness a White Invasion? And it was the first time that I had actually learned what this looked like in non-predominantly white context, not mm, geographically. And it was just like, why have I been robbed of this rich history? Why are we pretending that this is just a thing that we all of a sudden, black people are allowed to engage? Um, going back a little bit to the theme of inclusion, um, we've talked a lot throughout the episode about side B spaces being predominantly white. How have the two of you found your sense of belonging or sense of community within the side B world? Your faces are saying so much. In this <laughs> and I'm kind of sad the listeners can't see them. <laughs> oh, yeah. What I okay. want to say. What I want to say. <laughs> I will say that it has been about as receptive and inclusive as the wider evangelical world. Mm. Which is to say, not very. Um, And I think, as usual, you find, especially if you're someone who is conscious of these things and chooses to make relationships accordingly, you find people, right? You find your people. That's kind of how we're here. We've kind of... (laughs) through friendships and whatever, trickled down until we found a group of people which, oh, hey, there's, like, at least three of us. <laughs> <laughs> but the reason there's even three of us is because it was comfortable a comfortable enough space with people who actually care and are listening. Mm. But it took time to find that, right? It, you, you, you go from place to place, and you're like, oh, mm, mm-hmm. we were vibing on scripture, and then you said something that made me have to... Um, you know, say a word of prayer. Uh, <laughs> you know, like, the wider space is about the same as the evangelical world, which it's on fire right now, so. Mm. We, yeah. But there are, but it's also true that there are people who are genuinely committed to making space for women, making space for AFAB folks, making space for um, black people, and you, it just takes time to find, to like mm-hmm. find your people. Yeah, I, I would say I don't have much experience with like side B in person community. Um, most of my like queer community has been secular, not religious at all. Um, but I would say that I found a sense of belonging in like side B spaces for sure in some senses. Um, I think what's been challenging is that there's a lot of, a lot of these mentions like there's like a culture of whiteness like there's like the white culture like a white way of engaging with issues there's a, like a white way of dealing with arguments there's like a white way of like thinking about the world that's never really examined all that often in these spaces so I think that's mm. the challenging bit. Um, but I think also I've like some of my (laughs) closest relationships are white people. So I love white people, but I think there is (laughs) like, there's a challenge of having to like explain a history, um, Mm -hmm. and also not being able to kind of like fall back on like a shared, like upbringing and connection, like I feel more easily connected to black folks than I do people who are queer. (laughs) Like, even if they're Mm. straight, like, I feel like a more sense of connection almost automatically because of, like, a shared history um, than I do to queer folks. Fascinating. Yeah, that makes sense. I think I resonate with that. Uh, I feel like we've we might have mentioned this in passing before, but like how you go into how um, kind of piggybacking off what you said, shall we like just a white way of interacting with people, which, and it's hard to define until it's in the moment. 
and then you can be like, hey, here's how I would have done this, and here's how this would have been received, or here's what I would have said if I were amongst you know, my family, uh, you know, church family, whatever, you know, at, you know, at work. Um, I work at an HBCU, so it's mostly black. Um, and it, how, here's how it would have been said and received. But I will say, because growing up, like, it really is true that queer people find each other is I will say a solid 80% of my friend group is no longer straight, but like growing up. Um, so some of that I've, I've begun to realize, I feel like I shall be, and I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just talking about my experience, but like, um, I used to think, Oh, I'm just comfortable with black people, whether they're queer or not. But then realizing, Oh wait, all the black people that I'm comfortable with, whose language I speak and who are just like ripping off each other, most of them aren't straight. <laughs> like, so like having to like learning to parse that, you know, par learning to like examine that and be like, oh, maybe I think that was that's a specifically black thing. That's a specifically black gay thing, black queer thing. Like, oh wait, there's another level of this, and because people just don't be straight, man. You know? Like. I mean, some are, um, many are actually, but like, I don't know, we, I don't know that finding each other subconsciously thing is so ridiculously real. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, give it a decade, y'all, just see what shakes out. <laughs> <laughs> what would you all say are tools that because of your experience as a black person in the U.S., um, that you have because of that experience or like because of that history and because of that culture that have enriched your faith or enriched your understanding of your sexuality? I feel like this is another one of those questions that has kind of been sprinkled through the episode, but is there anything that you can like explicitly think about that you want to talk about? Yeah, I've definitely had um, experiences with friends who were going through, I think particularly like white queer friends who were going through like discrimination and different things like that for like the first time and able to like give language to what they're experiencing like oh like when I walk into a space I feel like I don't 100% like whatever it's like yeah that's like discrimination like that's not being included like that's what that is um <laughs> and helping to give language to that um I would say also because I'm I'm just like used to not expecting to fit in like at work or in church or in this other space of having to build my own community I think that's something that I've brought into queer spaces the idea of like importance of building community and family because you can't like expect the world to provide that for you um mm. is something that I definitely I think draws on being black in America um I think also I've definitely like learned from like my parents and like things like that like when do you assimilate when do you fight back like Oof. when do you like push versus like I have to like have a job so I have to like figure this out versus like having yeah. to stand up at every single thing so kind of like learning to pick your battles and like what does that mean and like how do you like navigate environments that are not 100% um, affirming to who you are something I definitely learned from my family and stuff like that um so those are some of like the tools i feel like i've gained from being black in america it's mostly like how to navigate hostile environments <laughs> yeah. i think it's like the yeah. main thing <laughs> i fully had not processed the like the being very intentional about building community and family because spaces are not engineered for you as a, something that came from my black experience. And I've been on a soapbox for years about like, why do people not understand? Like you have to work at community. Wow, <laughs> that's wild. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, huh? No, I, I second that like super wholeheartedly because um, I think that's like, for most of us inside you, that's going, that is like the main struggle. It's like, okay, I've, you know, struggled theologically, I'm at this place, but our whole world is built to have community one way. Mm. How do we do it differently? And it's like, hey, black in America, <laughs> a history of like families being torn apart for like decades. 
this is how, and also like having to make my own community in this space where even now it's a little alienating. Here's, you know, what I do. I, I don't know. I, I also, I'm seconding that, but I'm also seconding Sarah, that I had not thought of it as coming from, I had not thought of that ability slash perspective as coming from that experience, and yet it's like a one for one. Um, yeah. yeah. I think for me, the like, particularly, like, I didn't grow up in black church, but my parents did, and so their approach to scripture was very holistic. I, I know, I've i noticed that there's, like, a really strong emphasis on the New Testament, for good reason. I mean, Jesus, have you met him? Like, <laughs> he's great. Uh, kind of, you know, what we've all been waiting for. Uh, <laughs> but I think there was, like, this um, acceptance of, like, whole, the whole scripture, and, real, and not just acceptance, but, like, what might really seeing yourself in every part of the story and like mm. yes understanding the historical mm. context like o- apart from yourself and your experiences but that only adds to like the richness and like i think for some of us we're like looking for like spiritual language for like where am where am i even in the world of wilderness and the lord's like you are here and it's like the story of Joseph, or you're here, and it's the story of Rahab, or you're here, and it's the story of Tamar, which is, woo, that's a hot one. Like, <laughs> that, you know, like, I, there really is so much language for who we are and where we are and how the Lord wants to encounter us. And I feel like that's, in the Black Church, that's extremely emphasized. Um, the Old Testament and the Prophets, uh, the Psalms, there's just such a richness of, like, seeing how god moves in this way seeing how jesus himself as you know our salvation comes into that and like she even changes that story like what does it mean for rahab that she is like the ancestor or one of the ancestors of jesus like how does that change her story from something that feels mostly unsatisfying to be honest like it's kind of good but it's kind of bad but yet jesus um, for Hagar, same thing. Like, this kind of story that ends kind of like, yay, but also, what? And it's like, but Jesus. I don't know. Mm. I, I feel like, okay, I'm, I'm gonna rewind. <laughs> I feel like I was getting into, like, preaching mode. If you say, but Jesus, three times, you're automatically preaching. So, <laughs> <laughs> but, like, I don't know. Like, we need language, and I feel like the Lord really is like that is a human need to understand and be able to process healthfully mm. to have language for your experiences and the lord really does want to provide that for us and i think you have to be open to like the whole of scripture and the marginalized parts the like smaller parts the hidden stories or the mm. stories we just don't talk about that often to really get that language like there's so much i don't know yeah, judges man the book of, of judges is wild <laughs> Yes. <laughs> just going off of that, I think also, like, growing up, especially with my mom and, like, my parents, definitely, like, reading themselves into scripture has definitely impacted the way that I approach scripture. Like, yeah, I'm right here, and that's me, and, like, that's how God views me, and, like, that's us. And, like, also, like, the not shying away from the judgment aspects of, like, yeah, God will, like, fight for you and might, like, destroy people on your behalf because they treated you badly. And, like, it's okay to, like, want that. (laughs) I also feel like that's something that I learned from being Black, but also just, like, Black theological tradition, too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I'm, like, literally resisting having, like, a Holy Ghost party over here. I'm like, (laughs) yes, like, uh, read the Psalms, read Judges, read Hosea, read, um, oh my gosh. I don't know. I don't know. The Lord cares about us, yeah. and judgment actually says that God cares about us when it's on us mm. or on other people on our behalf. Yeah. It's like I don't know. Sorry. Ooh. Anyway, I'm a mute. <laughs> Man, Jesus is so cool, and I think Jesus, the lens of the like black theological experience. Uh. <laughs> wow. I think one of the the big things that I am taking away from this conversation is just the reminder um, 
of how clearly we see our experience in the scripture and that I think sometimes I feel like I'm going through something new and like there are no words for this experience and no other human person has ever experienced this level of XYZ thing that I'm feeling. But the reminder, they're like, no, 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 no. <laughs> like go look in the text and see all of these people who were going through these things and what God was teaching them and how God was speaking to them. Um, yeah. So thank you both for ministering to me in that way. I think for our last question, we're about to in the episode but the question is if you could talk to baby queer you what would you want them to know about finding their place in the world about being black and queer just like what message would you send to 10 20 years ago you i think my first thing would be like she's not worth it because that's a whole nother thing of like don't cry for that person (laughs) Mm. she's not worth it that would be my first thing but i think Another thing would be that you're going to find the places where you fit and not fitting isn't a sign that like you don't have value and worth. It's just another sign that this Mm. world is not our home and we're not going to 100% fit here. Um, Mm. I think also I would say to, I think when I was young, I, because I, was discovering like my queerness in a very white environment I thought I had to like take on aspects of like white culture in order to be queer and like telling myself you don't have to do that like you can (laughs) you can be who you are without having like change yourself to fit into a certain type of culture like you can just be you um Hmm. so that's what I would say to baby me um I think I would tell myself to not be afraid of community because um, I know for me there was just a big fear of if I connect with people who are the same as me, that that's just a slippery slope down to hell. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like, like, um, no, like, no woman is an island. Like, you can't actually survive in spiritual, without spiritual community. Like, no one can in any context, and that's not even how the Lord really works. And, um, I don't know, I I think I was just afraid for a very long time of, like, speaking out, of reaching out, of either scared that I would search and not find people, or find people and I wouldn't fit, or find people and I would fit, and then fall in love. And that's, you know, the most, that's the worst thing that can happen to (laughs) an LGBT person that's Christian, is falling in love. Like, mm. I'm like, and I'm saying that in like, slash sarcasm. Um, like, yeah. Um, and I think people don't. I've seen this before, and I feel like it's worth saying, particularly to anyone who is of color and is listening. Um, I feel like people don't understand what that means to for a Christian culture to emphasize love and marriage so much. And then to find out your LGBT and realize, no, that's actually, according to the church, the worst thing that could possibly happen to you mm-hmm. is falling in love. The thing that you long for and that our whole culture says, is that whether you're secular or Christian, says it's like necessary. And then it's like, no, this is the thing that will undo you. Mm-hmm. Um, and being, I, I would just go back in time and be like, that is not true. Um, and also, even if it were true, you still need community, and so you'll just have to, like, you just have to be brave enough to go find that community. Um, mm. It just took me a super long time that it didn't have to. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you both so much for being here, for sharing your stories. I feel like this is one of those episodes that we could do three more episodes on because I have so many more questions and so many more things that I um, want to talk about. Um, But yeah, thank you all for being here. It was great. Thank you for having me.